Very good. <clears throat> so let's see if we can answer some questions in the topic of optics. Uh, and this just incorporates the microscopy, light microscopy, and electron microscopy just by association from the lecture slides. So I'm just going to bunch them all together. And these come from past papers from the department as well as, uh, as, well as uh, some other representative things. So let's see if we can get this ball rolling. And we're going to start with some essay questions. And really, I'd like you to pause this video, pause this video, and try and work on these, on these questions and see if you can figure them out. See if you can figure them out. Very well. So let's get started. And what's the, the most important thing with regards to essay question, really, is to understand that the department scores your test using keywords that need to be in your essay. Some keywords, and as long as you have them, maybe you have some other things mixed around, but as long as you have them, at least some of the score is going to be credited. So compare the advantages and disadvantages of electron microscopy to conventional light microscopy or microscope, microscope. And really, in the level that we're taught, in the level that we're taught, and you can research on it a little bit, as I did, and it's kind of interesting, but in the very bare essentials, when you're talking about electron microscopy, the, I would say the disadvantage is that you have to, you have to prep, prep the specimen. We already mentioned in, in the electron microscopy, there has to be a vacuum in order for the electrons to accelerate through that vacuum and interact with the specimen or the sample, They're really the same thing. So the sample can't be, can't be alive, it needs to be prepped, and there's some sort of interesting concepts to it with contrast material that has been administered as well. But the positive thing with the electron microscopy is the resolution, is the resolution. And we already discussed the wavelength that is associated with electrons to be smaller than 0 0.005 nanometers. So, and in light microscopy, and also I can just add here, I can add here cost as well, cost as well. And it's kind of important uh, because I'm assuming that you know that electron microscopes are quite the more expensive than light microscopes. So for light microscopy, what I would say is the negative is that uh, resolution is limited compared to the electron microscopy, resolution is limited. I'm just going to put here uh, light microscopy. The positive thing is there's no, no preparation, no preparation required, required and low cost or lower, lower costs. And this does not really pertain to the cone focal microscope, just the, just the conventional light microscope. Very good. So uh, these are really what they're looking for. It's very bare essential, so we're done with this. Explain the operation of electron microscope, scanning or transmission. And I'm just going to read it out. If you wanna, If you wanna take notes, you may, but I'm not going to tell you anything different. I'm just going to show you how I would explain it. So first of all, if I'm asked to explain it, I'll also do, do maybe a quick drawing that, that shows the electron beam that's being focused via this magnet here on the specimen, and I'd write maybe vacuum, and maybe I have some sort of interactions here. But basically what I would say is that electrons are accelerated through a vacuum focused via magnets on a specimen that, that needs to be prepped. And also we can have, let's say, let's say I'm talking about scanning, different interactions of backscattered electrons, OGE electrons, X-ray, luminescence, backscattered electrons are being collected and interpreted into an image. Or if I'm talking about transmission, the electron beam passing through the specimen goes through inelastic and elastic interactions. And those interactions are also being collected and interpreted into an image. So this is really how I would explain electron microscopes, just, just keeping to the bare essentials. And you need to really talk about the keywords here. The keywords is, is obviously electron beam, vacuum, um, magnets, magnets, backscattered interaction, backscattered interactions, or in the transmission case, elastic or inelastic, elastic or inelastic interactions. Very good. Just stick to the, to the key phrases. Don't really remember all of the definition itself because it would, it, would, it would be very overwhelming. Just remember, electron microscopes, there's all these things in it. Very good. Explain the difference between fluorescence to light microscope, given advantage of fluorescence microscope. And really, 
let's, let's just tackle this one. I would say that the difference between fluorescence and light microscope is that fluorescence is taking advantage of the, of the inherent property of certain molecules to absorb light and emit it. And I would say these molecules are called fluorophores, and they can be excited within a given spectrum, and they can be, um, and they would emit it within a given spectrum. And this is really the difference between fluorescence and light microscope. So fluorescence uses the inherent property of fluorophores. And I would explain what a fluorophore is, and maybe I'd tell a little bit about the spectra, but that's it. The advantage of fluorescent microscope is, I would say there are many, but the, the two main ones is that there's specific, it's specific because you can excite specific molecules by applying specific filters, really. And maybe, maybe when we're talking about the difference between fluorescence uh, and light microscope, if, if you want to make your, your answer more noticeable, maybe you want to mention that there's filters that filter the different spectra. Maybe not. It depends, it depends entirely on you. So the first of all, the advantage here is being specific. And second of all, you get better contrast, better contrast. And by that, by that, I really mean that up against a, ba a black background, I'm going to have some fluorophores here. So I'm going to have better co contrast between this, this fluorophore that's emitting light and its surroundings. So I'm going to be able to resolve it with better contrast. It's going to stand out. And that's what I really mean. If you don't know what contrast is, it's going to stand out against its background because the background is not going to fluoresce while only the flu fluorophore is going to fluoresce. Very good. And we're going to uh, move on. What is the approximate resolution limit of a light microscope? Explain why. And really, this was in the presentation. It was mentioned to be 0.2 micrometers. Um, I think it was calculated for a 500 nanometer uh, green light. And the reason really, the why, and again, this is just a number that you need to remember. Nothing, nothing much I can do uh, as far as giving you intuition. This is just a figure. But the why is that we have the ab equation explaining that we have our, our resolution limit is dependent on the wavelength and the numerical aperture. We can only increase this one so much using conventional light microscope. And we can on only decrease this one so much because we're using visible light. Hopefully the Skype is not in the way too much. But anyways, the ab equation actually gives us our limit. And our limit basically we're maxed out around this, around this figure for this, uh, for this wavelength of light. Very good. Let's move on. Compare a virtual to a real image. And really, this is, this is, this is a classic uh, question. And when we're talking about real image, we're talking about real image. Real is that it's larger, larger, and inverted. And for virtual, virtual is that it's, is that it's larger and upright or I would add same orientation as the image itself. So this is really uh, the different, uh, sorry, same orientation as the object itself, as the object itself. And really you can say that a real image is a real uh, converging point of, of light rays, and this is a virtual converging point of light rays, blah, blah, blah. And this is really the, the entire base comparison that you can expect. Very good. Explain astigmatism and chromatic aberrations. And really, when you're talking about this, often people or often students say, oh, this, there was, in the presentation, there was kind of a lot of material around astigmatism, and I don't remember all of it. But what you need to remember is key phrases, and that's what I'm really going to give you. I'm really going to have to move on a little bit more. Very good. So we had astigmatism. And good things to remember about astigmatism is, first of all, object off the optical axis. Secondly, and it's phrased differently in the lecture and the lecture note, or rather the lecture slides, what I like to say is that the vertical, vertical and horizontal curvatures are not the same, are not identical. Identical. Or I can write I can even write in parentheses here spherical. Not 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 spherical. Causing more than one focal point. Focal point and a blurry image. And these are really what you need to remember as far as the key phrases of the optical axis. Uh, uh, vertical and horizontal curvatures not identical. 
this is really what you what you need to have in essence. Anything you have around it is not going to be bad at all. And for chromatic aberration, chromatic chromatic aberration. And whenever I start uh, I start describing an, an aberration, maybe I wasn't clear about it in the video, maybe you didn't see the videos, I always start with the statement due to imperfection in the lens system. Due to imperfections in the lens system. And then blah, 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 blah. Object is off the optical axis, da, 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 et cetera, et cetera. So chromatic aberration, what you're really looking for is the incident Incident light enters <clears throat> enters the lens system and is broken down to its uh, wavelength components. Wavelength length components. Really, this is enough. And what you really need to know with this is that. There's light entering the lens and it's broken down to wavelength components. You can say different colors just to make sure that the professor is maybe not an idiot and knows what you're talking about. Different colors. And what I would also add is I would add AKA dispersion. Dispersion. What's important to understand is that dispersion is the biological, uh, biological definition to uh, chromatic aberration and chromatic aberration is the physical physical quantitative um, description of it so if you if you see dispersion in an exam in a test this is what they mean and they have often confused students so don't be the one that's confused because now you know dispersion and chromatic aberration one and the same very good all right so define resolution <clears throat> explain how it can be improved by the ab formula just a reminder, the AB formula for resolution is one of them is 0, 6, 1, uh, theta, whatever, n sinus theta. Very good. This is beam wavelength. I really am not going to go through this formula again. It's all in the video. But as far as defining resolution, the one thing that I want to say is that the minimal distance, the minimal distance at which two points are resolvable, resolvable as two different points, it's two different points. This is how I would explain resolution and how it can be improved either by either by decreasing the wavelength and, or increasing the numerical aperture. And this, this thing commonly is referred to as the numerical aperture. So it's either either getting the half angle of the objective to be larger or the refractive index to be larger. And again, if if this goes up or this goes down, this would go down. And the minimal distance, the smaller it is, the better my resolution is. So that's how I improve my resolution. Check. Let's uh, see what we have next as well. Very good. Some true or false questions. And don't be lured into, into maybe thinking that true or false are easier because there's no open essay to answer. So I want you to pause this video now and see if you can work on these on your own. Very good. So let's get started. Distortion affects the sharpness of the image. And this is, this is kind, of a, kind of an easy flunk. Why? Because we know that aberrations result, and this is the idea, the aberrations result in more than one focal point. And whenever you have more than one focal point, you have a blurry image. But distortions, and by distortions I mean the pincushion distortion or the fisheye, which is also, how do they call it, barrel, barrel, which is really a dumb name because this is how it's called, the fisheye, you can look it up. But really, distortions distort the image. They kind of maybe make it maybe make it kind of stand in like this, maybe make it kind of squinge in, but they don't affect the sharpness because you don't have more than one focal point. So this would be false. This would be incorrect. Distortions do not affect the sharpness of the image. False. And you can actually get a lot of very expensive fisheye lenses with very high sharpness and resolution. We're going to move on. Aberrations often result in more than one focal point. And this is true, obviously, because that's the idea with the aberrations. Uh, spherical aberration when you have when you have different different focal points for for different uh, light rays or maybe chromatic aberrations when they split up according to their to their wavelength you you will have more than one focal point and this is why you have a blurry image very good a fluorescent microscope is able to produce considerably better resolution than a conventional light microscope and this is this is a common misconception that this may be true but think about it for a second we had the AB formula that dictates that we have some sort 
of relationship to get to get better resolution. So if I want to get better resolution, really, really I need to work with these things here. And light microscopes and uh, fluorescent microscopes, they're both using visible light. They're both using visible light. So their 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 limits are essentially the same. Their limits are essentially the same. So I'm not going to get better resolution. I may get better contrast from fluorescence microscope. I'm not going to get better resolution. So, so this saying a fluorescent microscope is able to produce considerably better resolution. And notice they said considerably. So they're actually looking looking to make that statement. That statement is false. Let's move on. Light passing through a concave lens will be diffracted towards the optical axis. And let's see what that's all about. And we have this is a concave lens. And concave is really this um, diverging. There you go. Forgot, forgot about the English language for a second. They're diverging. And the optical axis that they're talking about is really this axis here that goes right through the middle of the lens. So if I have a light ray here that goes through the middle, it's going to go and to keep on going unchanged. But in a, in a diverging lens, if I have a light ray, it's going to go away here in a way here, maybe here as well, and here as well. So we know that when light is getting, is incident light that is getting into this lens, it's going to be diffracted away from this axis. It's going to be going away. That's why it's called a concave or diverging lens. So light passing through a, con a concave lens will be diffracted towards the optical axis. That is incorrect. That is not true. False. All right. It is possible to calculate the magnification solely based on the uh, object size. And really what's important to understand is that we had the, this, this formula of, of magnification is um, image or other object over image or the object size over the image size. And if I had an image size of one and an object size, or is that, that's the other way around, sorry. Mix them all together. If I have an object size of one and it formed an image of two, I have a magnification of two. So really, we need we need these we need these things just based on this formula. And they really, for this true or false question, they need, they actually made sure that you need to know this formula. So it isn't possible to calculate solely based on the object size. I need the image size. False. <coughs> all right, all right. What else do we have? In spherical aberration, light rays entering the lens parallel to the optical axis and further away from it will be diffracted more. And to be honest, if I'm reading this in one sitting, I'm kind of confused. So what I would do is I would just draw the spherical aberration. I just draw it. And then I try and, and understand what they're talking about. And in spherical aberrations, I know that if I have light rays that are further away from the optical axis, they're going to be diffracted more. So maybe they're going to meet here. And maybe light rays, I'm going to draw them in a different color. Maybe light rays that are pretty close, they're going to be diffracted less. Maybe they're going to meet over here, over here. So let's see what they're saying now. <clears throat> let's see. In spherical aberration, which is this, light rays entering the lens parallel to the optical axis and further away, they're talking about these yellow lines, will be diffracted more. I would say that is true. I would say that is true. Very good. So hopefully you found a little bit of intuition in these questions. And hopefully you've, you've gone to a better understanding of what's going on using these questions. And I'll see you in the next video.